Welcome to Central Presbyterian Church. We are an inclusive community and everyone is welcome here. Let us worship God. Thank you, Lee. Beautiful. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship? God has put all things under Jesus' feet and has made him head of the church. He is above all rule and authority and power and dominion. 
The church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let us pray. O Christ, who lived to show what life is like, who died to show that sin is death, who rose to raise us up to eternal life, help us to follow you and love you forever. Amen. Please be seated. Would you join me now in the prayer of humility? Jesus, who sat at the table with outcasts and sinners, we confess that too often our words and actions are not consistent with our faith in you. Often we ignore the needy, show indifference to the lonely, and reject those who seem different from us. Forgive us, we pray. Empower us to reach out in love and acceptance through your name. Amen. To all and to each, on his community and on his friends, where regret is real, Jesus pronounces his pardon and grants us the right to begin again. Thanks be to God.
As God in Jesus Christ has forgiven us, let us forgive and be at peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please join me in our attending prayer. Lord God, fill us with joy this Easter tide as we celebrate the good news of Jesus' provision for us of living bread, baptismal waters, and a church community. Amen. That's a sister for you. You make a spot for her and she wants to sit her side. I tell you. All right, how are you doing today? Good? Awesome. Well, today I brought some things with me. And I'm going to see if you guys can kind of like help me out and tell me like maybe what they are, what they're used for. All right, so let's see here. Let's see. All right, so first I have this. What is this? A beater. Yeah. What is it used for? For mixing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for mixing. So will it work as it is? I mean, kind of, I guess, kind of a little bit, but is that really what it's supposed to be used for? No, no. So it needs to have the other part, the electric mixer part that you stick in there and make it work, right? So it really needs something else to make it go. Okay, let's see. Uh, what is this? A video game. Will it work as it is? No. Why not? It needs the console to make it work. Awesome. Let's see. And this one. What is this? A flashlight. A flashlight. And I'm going to have you. Is batteries are in there? No. No. But it's still a flashlight. Will it work as it is? No. And why not? It needs the batteries to make it work. So all of these things aren't broken, but they don't work right. 
And in some ways, we are kind of like that too. The Bible is God's love letter to us. It's kind of like an owner's manual that tells how to make us work right. It is our basic instructions before leaving earth. And just like the things need another part to be truly useful, we need God in us to help us become the best we can be. When we live God's way, we work best for God's glory. We are rich and complete with God. God makes us more than we could ever be on our own. Let's pray. Gracious God, we ask that you give us direction, clarity, and wisdom into your truth. Let your word guide our choices as we go through our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And there is class for everybody. If you'd like to come upstairs for a combined class, you may. If not, you may stay and enjoy church. Thank you. It's the time in our service when we share our joys and concerns with one another, and uh, we will with God as well. So let's take a look at uh, some of the... Well, the uh, slide that I put in didn't get uptaken. Interesting. So it wasn't uploaded. So this is last week's slides, but... Uh, uh, Lori is still in need of our prayers. I understand that uh, she did have uh, another surgery, and we need to pray for the wound to heal well. For her to go home, I understand that Morgan is home and is still in pain, but is doing better. So we want to continue to pray for her as well. In addition, we have two written prayer concerns, one about Bill W., who has cancer, so we want to keep him in our prayers for healing, and Everett B., with, for brain surgery, so we want to pray for him as well. Let us turn to God in prayer. Lord God, we are so grateful that we can come to you in prayer. Many a Sunday, we lift up those who are in need of your healing, and we do that today. We pray for Bill and Everett, for Lee and Lori and Morgan. We pray for congregation members and friends and family who are stricken with cancer, and we pray for congregation members and friends and family who deal with chronic pain. Lord God, we pray for your healing spirit to be upon them. We pray that they receive the very best medical care and that you touch the folks who are caring for them uh, through medicine or through nursing or through assisted living. You touch them with your care and your compassion so that they can heal. 
Lord God, we are grateful that in our faithfulness in prayer, you are ever more faithful to us. With your love, with your grace, with forgiveness when we ask, with reconciliation, and the joy of being lifted up into your presence through the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we are grateful for your, the physical healing that we know through you, and we're grateful for the spiritual healing and emotional healing and mental healing that we receive through you. So, Lord God, we pray for different life situations, perhaps our own, perhaps our families, perhaps those whom we know and love, perhaps a neighbor we met on the street. But, Lord God, we pray for your healing. And, Lord God, we pray to become instruments of your wholeness, to become instruments of your love, to become instruments of your peace. Inspire us with your Holy Spirit to love, to see as you see, to see folks as you see. Inspire us to serve and to help and Teach us to trust. When we trust in you, we have the foundation to be able to trust in others. Lord God, we are grateful for this Easter tide, a time when we can celebrate your love, your grace, your hope, your resurrection, your new life. May we be Easter people. As we pray in Jesus' name, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. First scripture reading today is from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may perceive what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all.
you choir. It's a delight as a congregation member to be able to join in such beautiful praise. Thank you. So our scripture is a little longer than what's in your bulletin. I thought that you could handle the entirety of um, Jesus' prayer for his disciples that he has um, at the end of the Last Supper together. So that is chapter 17. So we're going to start at verse 1. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know, what, know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them. And know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Concluding the Gospel of John is tricky. Last week, our Gospel reading included a summary of the purpose of the Gospel. It said that these signs and events were recorded, they were chosen and recorded by 
John the Evangelist, so that we, the hearers and the readers, may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that through believing, we may have life in his name. Last week, we reflected upon belief and doubt and trust. That would be a fitting conclusion to John's gospel. But it isn't the last narrative of the gospel. The last narrative is of a really big fishing catch and Jesus' seaside breakfast with his disciples. But that, perhaps you remember, was the very first sermon I preached on as your pastor. So we've been there quite recently. So I thought it might be a fitting conclusion to our reflection upon the gospel to explore the section of Jesus' farewell speech. Commentaries call it a farewell discourse. It's in chapters 14 through 17. It's at the conclusion of the Passover meal. Jesus gives the disciples instructions for living in the new covenant that Jesus establishes through his death and resurrection. These are instructions for the church, for the community of Christ. They include two more I am statements, which we'll, oops, two more I am statements, which we will explore in the next two weeks. So we'll begin the conclusion, concluding uh, John's, our studies and our reflections on John's gospel with the last thing Jesus does before his betrayal, the very last thing that Jesus does. He prays for his disciples. It is his prayer for us. Jesus prays as his mission is being completed and his disciples' mission is changing and beginning anew. Jesus prays for the fulfillment of his mission and for his glorification. The second half of the Gospel of John is called the Book of Glory, where Jesus' mission of redemption and reconciliation come to fruition or completeness in his glorification on the cross. But the Jesus then turns to prayers for his disciples and the future disciples that they will inspire. So the first thing Jesus prays about is our protection. Jesus prays, protect them in your name that you have given to me. Jesus prays for strong protection of his followers. We pray for protection, too, for traveling mercies, for protection against the ways of evil, or protection against temptation. We live in a violent world. We live in a world of terrorism and war. And so we pray for protection. But this prayer that Jesus prays isn't concerned with protection from violence or from hatred or other external threats that Jesus' followers may experience. Jesus prays, Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given to me, which means... Protect them in your power with your authority that you have given to me so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus prays, protect my followers, not from external powers and principalities, but from internal divisions and strife and hatred. Jesus understood what the bigger threat to his people, his covenantal people, was. Divisions and hatred within 
the church. The early history of the American church, I studied in college, American church history is the history of church schisms and splits. The recent experience of many American church is so sadly the same. I think it may be helpful for us who are stuck in these patterns of discord and division to remember why Jesus prayed for God to use God's power to protect Jesus' followers. Jesus, Jesus prays that we may be one. So Jesus prays for unity. And Jesus prays so that we may be complete and experience Jesus' joy. Jesus' joy isn't made complete individually in our individual selves, but his joy is made complete in our fellowship. I believe contemporary churches are at a critical time. And our biggest concern isn't failing, falling membership. The divisions within denominations, within our local group of churches, and even in our congregations is tearing us apart and diminishing people's interest in following Jesus. So what do we do? Well, certainly, the answer must be that everyone in this congregation has to agree with me. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Believe that'll work? (laughs) No, of course not. But that's how we all act. We act like you must believe what I believe for there to be unity between us. And it has never worked. But if we refocus our understanding of faith from belief to trust in God, there is much more room for unity. Because we each trust God, and we trust the power of the Spirit to guide us and empower us, we can love each other, even through disagreement. To act into the unity that Jesus prays for us, we need to practice loving one another. We need to be open to the Spirit instead of insisting on our own way. We need to trust one another enough to listen to one another. And it's a hard, hard task for we humans, but we need to recognize that we can be wrong and practice humility. With love, with openness, with trust, and with humility, we can act into the unity that Jesus prayed for us. Now, I do think some understanding of each other's motivations in faith may be helpful too. Jack Haberer was the editor of a Presbyterian periodical, the Presbyterian Outlook. So he had a chance to go to lots of presbyteries, talk to lots and lots of different people. And maybe eight to 10 years ago, he, he had a, a lecture series about our motivations. That if we could understand each other's motivations, 
that we could have less hostility toward one another. He thought it would help to understand that we each value faith differently. So some of us are motivated by truth. He, he gave some uh, interesting uh, descriptions of these folks. So the descriptions are from uh, Jack Haberer. But uh, these are the folks who argue absolutely every point in Sunday school. <laughs> and at the Presbytery meetings. They're the ones that are always at the mic if you've been to Presbytery meetings. <laughs> Haberer described these folks as they could be on either side, on any side, but they were always on a side. In the best instances, with love and openness and listening and humility, these folks who are motivated by truth can seek to give theological insights to help local congregations and bodies of the congregation steer toward God's righteousness as we try to live in covenant together. But often, these folks just passionately know that they're right. Others of us are motivated by piety. These folks are the first to start working in the seasonal prayer journals. They pick up the devotionals that are in the back of the church. They let us know when they're not there. They practice prayer and Bible reading and personal relationship with God. Unless they happen to be a pastor too, they often don't participate in committee meetings or in presbytery, which is our loss in love, openness, listening, and humility, these folks can help congregations stay connected and open to God's spirit. But sometimes their pietism becomes isolating because they practice it alone and aren't motivated to serve on committees or mission projects. And that is our loss. Others are motivated by service, and by mission. These folks are passionate about causes and about the people. Poverty, domestic violence, human trafficking, elder abuse, refugees, immigration. They can do good work that can become burned out if they don't practice love and openness and listening and humility. These folks need to stay connected to God and to the congregation, their life source, as they do good work in the world. And finally, some of us are motivated by unity. These folks are motivated to love one another and get along. Harborer described these folks as sometimes as his descriptions are uh, as bleeding hearts who aren't much fun. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm probably in this category. <laughs> I am motivated by truth. And I love theology, but I am most motivated by unity. You may have noticed that when you present an issue to me or an argument for one side or another, that I do respond with my thoughts, but I also mull it over for a time, and I'll discuss it with others, because I think that other perspectives may be useful too. So that is how I practice speaking the truth with love. Every one of these types, perhaps you were able to identify, ah, I'm the pious, I'm the piety type, or I'm the truth type. Every one of these types. We need to hear Paul's truth and instruction to speak the truth with love. 
every one of these types, whether we're the pious type, whether we're the truth-seeking type, speak the truth with love. And in that way, we can practice and live into Christian unity. Recognizing our own motivations and the motivations of other Christians can help us understand one another's perspective. And I sure hope it can reduce the hostilities and divisions within the church. It can also help us move beyond the assumption that only being of one mind can we be unified. We imagine that everyone should see truth the way we see it, or be spiritual the way we're spiritual, or be passionate about the same missions that we are passionate about, or sacrifice all for unity. We think unity means that we need to be of one mind. Diego Rivera made a mural at the Detroit Institute of Arts that reminds me of this kind of understanding of unity. Can you see it? All kind of... There's a beauty in that, and there is also kind of terrible. Well, if that's the case... If unity doesn't come of being of one mind, or (laughs) of your being of my mind, you may be wondering, so where does unity come from? Where does Christian unity come from? There are movements of the early church in the book of Acts, and they always happen when the church is careful to attend to spiritual practices, the practices of preaching and scripture study and prayer together. And in those instances, there may be 10, it's described with the Greek word homothumidon. It's an inner unity of a group of people engaged in a similar act. The NRSV translates it to mean of one accord. It is the power of the Spirit enacted in the church as we are inspired by the Spirit and respond to God's grace poured out upon our Christian community. We can't make each other unified. We can't, we try it all the time, and it doesn't work. Unity is the gift of the Spirit upon a community. It's a holy invasion causing the church to rush together with a unified purpose. That's Christian unity. Jesus prays for us. Jesus prays, protect them through the indwelling spirit so that we may rush together and be of one purpose. In the spirit's unity, we may together know Jesus' joy and share in his love. Amen.
responding to the gospel and the good news in Jesus Christ, the church works. And so we have a few announcements for today. There will be two watch party opportunities for the chosen. Um, uh, several of you said that, yeah, we'd be interested in that. So beginning May 7th, uh, every Sunday morning from 9 to 10 through June 25th, we'll go through the season one of The Chosen uh, weekly, or you'll have a monthly opportunity uh, from 12 to 1 every third Wednesday, and that is right, be right before uh, cards in games. So if you are you want to bring your, your sack, bag lunch, bring a lunch, uh, watch The Chosen, chat about it, and then enjoy some cards and games. Our next announcement is about Impact Maslin. Shall I do that announcement or would you want to? All right, thank you. All right, Scott will announce it for me. till May 4th. Yes, and if the fee is a, a problem for anyone, I, we will take care of that. Just let us know. So I hope you'll sign up for Impact Maslin. It sounds like a fun day. Also, today hurrah, is our congregational meeting. It'll be after worship. And it is to uh, look at, uh, make four amendments to our bylaws. Uh, there, was a, um, there was the agenda in the back that you could, have, you could pick up with your bulletin, or you can grab the agenda in the back. Also, next Sunday, there's two, well, one's, One's pretty awesome. The other one's a good thing, too. Next Sunday, we'll be here. The youth will be providing some wonderful music for us. What do you all call that again? The Grace Notes. Do we have any verbal instructions for anyone about the Grace Notes? <laughs> all right. You have received your instructions. So next Sunday, we'll, uh, have a, we'll enjoy the music of the Grace Notes. A little, little uh, nice thing is next Sunday is our spiritual maturity in the senior mind. It is the last workshop. It's the last workshop. So if you can make it after church, come on down. I think that's my last announcement. How about anybody else? Lee. Just on Wednesday, the third is coming up very quickly, and we're hoping that uh, many people can join us 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. I'm looking forward to it. Bring your family and friends. <laughs> Any other announcements? Sandy. When, uh, when do we bring them? Beginning what day? In Beginning in July. All right. Thank you very much. Looking forward to that day when people will hunger and thirst no more, God will wipe away every tear and when we will worship with all the saints around the throne of the Lamb, let us offer our lives and labor to the Lord.
Let us pray. With glad rejoicing, we give you our gifts, God of great abundance. May these gifts and all the gifts of our lives be part of what you are doing in the world to turn mourning into dancing and to bring joy throughout your creation so that all your creatures might praise you. Amen. peace, to love and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, this day and forevermore. Amen. And you may stay for the congregational meeting, if you, if you can.
Let us begin our meeting with prayer. <laughs> 